Hi, I'm your host, Larry Smith, and you're listening to Speak Out Podcast, a community outreach of the Lawrence County Career Technical Center in Moulton, Alabama. Today, my co-host is Ashlyn Gresham, a junior at Lawrence County High School. Ashlyn, let's welcome our guest to the show. Hi, Larry. We're excited to introduce our guests for the podcast, Milton Bowens and Daphne Burgess Bowens. Daphne Burgess is an African-American artist from Sacramento, California. She graduated from UC Davis with a degree in art studio and has had a 25-year career in the arts. She's exhibited in galleries and museums, including the Sojourner Truth of African Heritage Museum, Sacramento State University, Brickhouse Art Gallery, Crocker Art Museum, African-American Historical and Cultural Museum, and the African-American Museum and Library in Oakland, California. She's been an art instructor for the past 22 years, holding artist-in-residence positions for various school districts in addition to the roles as an art educator and nonprofit resource provider. As a professional scenic artist for, va- for various theater and production companies for 20 years, she has held positions as a stage manager, light and sound technician, properties manager, and costume designer. As a visual artist, her early paintings and sculptures showed a more traditional style with bold colors and reflective nature, focusing on images of the African-American family. Her more recent work reflects her connections to the people and places of her past and how those relationships continue to influence her present by exploring subjects including body image, ethnicity, love, and culture. From 2014 to 2019, Burgess was the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Crocker Art Museum, leading the arts engagement initiative block by block. The goal of that initiative was to increase access to art experiences and co-created events within the community. She also worked with various nonprofit organizations, increasing access to art through classes, events, and exhibitions. Burgess moved to Alabama in 2019 and opened a gallery and studio, Gallery 157, in 2020. The goal of the space is, in, is to increase access to art and art experiences. She looked forward to her artistic journey in the South and sharing her passion for community building and art with a new audience. She currently provides fund development and consulting services for the Sojourner Truth African Heritage Museum and teaches art virtually. Milton Bowens, born and raised in Oakland, California, is the fifth son and tenth child of his family, which makes for his unique artistic signature, Milton 510. His work, which takes inspiration from artistic masters, American, world, and black history, bringing to the foreground issues of perseverance, pride, perspective, and affect. Milton's 510's Work has been exhibited, represented, showcased, and widely collected locally, nationally, and internationally. From fall 2009 to 2012, Milton 510's Afro-Classical Collection, an anthology of paintings depicting the importance of jazz, art, and words during the heyday of the Harlem Renaissance era, was used as part of the course study on the Harlem Renaissance. In the African Studies and Research Center of Cornell University, in 2011, Milton 510 received a resolution from the California Legislative Black Caucus for his work on arts and education in the public school. He's an Artistic License Award recipient and given by the California Lawyers for the Arts in 2013. He was a St. Hope Public Schools Beacon of Hope Award recipient. His work has been reviewed in numerous publications, including the Sacramento Bee, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the Los Angeles Times, as well as featured in the Transition Magazine, Issue 122, published by Harvard University. Milton's work within the educational system includes lecturing at over two dozen universities and college campuses and serving as artists in residence in several Northern California school districts. Milton strongly believes his art can educate as well as decorate. In 2019, he moved to Alabama to explore opportunities in the South for the arts and art education. He has shown work at University of Alabama, Alabama State, and is included in the art collection of Tuskegee Airmen National Museum in Tuskegee, Alabama. Well, welcome to Speak Out, Milton and Daphne. Thank you. Thank and, you guys uh, for having us. Thank you. It, it's good to have y'all. Um, I guess we'll kick off with this. How important is it for people to learn how to be expressive? Well, for me personally, I feel like through art, I can communicate things that I'm just not comfortable with saying in words. Um, it really provides an outlet for me to just kind of release and be expressive in a way that I feel the most comfortable. And I would say for me, I mean, for me, art is just the biggest stress reliever. Um, You know, getting out, you know, creative expression is is one of the things that I think is like central to just like peace of mind. 
So, and it's not just, you know, expressing or release of emotion. It really, at the core root, art is basically problem solving. And when we start to look at art as a vehicle for problem solving, then, you know, when you, when you, when you express, you are actually trying to deal with something on some level. So at the core root, especially for young people, when you when you when you look at art as a tool for just being a method of solving something creatively, that tends to transition over into every other aspect of your life. Exactly. Ashley. Yes, I agree with that. Um, The artistic expression is very important. So how could you or how are their career fields in life with artistic expression being a core? Well, I think now that um, we've kind of transitioned into thinking of art and artists as um, a profession, which um, was a long time coming in my opinion. Um, And one thing that um, Milton had brought up is that the term creatives is now being used to um, kind of describe this entire new field of not just visual artists or performing artists, but all of these different creative careers. And with that comes this idea of the creative economy. So really giving art now this kind of place as um, a professional career, I think has really helped other people start to explore the way they express themselves. And then also kind of turn that into um, a, a career for themselves in terms of maybe being um, um, uh, someone who works in the tech field, but then finding a creative spin to really kind of um, mold the the career that they want in um, the creative sector. Yeah, I mean, in terms of looking at, you know, creativity or careers in the arts, I think a lot of people on average are looking at a lot of old stereotypes when art is referenced. And the funny thing is, like, you see it most in multimedia or in in television and film. You always get this one depiction of what an artist is. And and the funny thing is that people don't pay attention to the simple fact that that image is being given to you through a form of basically artistic creativity. So what I like to tell students is, um, regardless of what your discipline is in the arts, if you just took the time to look at the end credits of a movie. Like, we all go to movies. We all, we all see movies. They even come on TV. But nobody really pays attention to the end of the movie until Marvel came along. So, so now Marvel makes you wait through all of the credits to see this one little extra scene. And the funny thing is I ask my students, I always tell them, I say, do you actually pay attention to the individuals that you're waiting before you see that last little clip that comes on at the end of the credits because what you're really looking at are job possibilities Mm -hmm. when you look at the end of the movie at the end of a movie you're going to see a list of well over 50 to 300 names every name is attached to an aspect that it took that movie to be made so you're looking at artists you're looking at designers you're looking at graphic people you're looking at tech, you're looking at fashion, you're looking at stunt, you're looking at all different aspects of creativity. Like like Daphne said, that's why the industry is shifting from the term of just being identified individually as an artist, but more so inclusive of everybody that is a creative. And that's the easy way I tell students is like what you, you what you should be looking at is if you see something in that movie that you liked, somebody had a job to pull that off. And if you can basically reverse engineer that, you'll find your profession. Well, and and so these possibilities then are endless. And you're you're talking about movie credits, but it could be in any industry, really. I mean, like, you know, uh, like in the auto industry, they use people that are artistically creative or here at uh, the Career Technical Center. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yeah, There 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 is a place for artists or some aspect of of creativity in every profession what about for the person that uh that really wants to be an artist in the traditional way and to to make money at that that's really that's really hard to do or i i wouldn't say that it's hard to do i i found it um kind of almost by accident really i i was an art major when i went to college 
but I didn't really know what I wanted to do outside of that. And I actually discovered a program called the um, Regional Occupational Program, which allowed me to take classes and have internships after I graduated college. And I fell into theater and loved it. And then from there on, it just kind of snowballed into working at theaters and then teaching classes. So I wouldn't say that I had a, a traditional kind of um, introduction into an art career, but definitely I feel like just being open to different experiences and then kind of really experimenting to mm -hmm. find out at first what I didn't want to do. Right. And that helped me kind of fine tune the path that I eventually took into being an art teacher and an artist and a, a community organizer. Well, which kind of takes us to this next question then, Ashley. Yeah, so how did y'all become interested in art? <laughs> we want to go first? Well, well, yeah, I mean, so for me, I, I have a dual path as, as an artist. Because when I, was, when I was young, I actually got in trouble doing art. I used to do graffiti. So I used mm -hmm. to run around the city and just tear stuff up. <laughs> and yeah, you know, I won't get into those details, but yeah. <laughs> but that actually landed me in art school. So you know, um, I was doing graffiti in Oakland. Um, got arrested for doing graffiti, and in my mediation hearing as a juvenile, juvenile, there was an, a, a, a teacher who worked for an after school program, who also was a teacher at the at an art school, the Renaissance School of Arts, and it's located in North Oakland. And in my mediation hearing, he, he basically convinced the mediator that it would be better for me to get into this art school than opposed to going through the juvenile correctional system. He was like, because, you know, if that, if that happens, he's just going to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, but this way we can, like, rechannel that energy. So I would say that actually was the first aspect of my art career getting started. Um, so I did 7th through 12th grade at an art school. Got a full ride scholarship to go to college at the California College of Arts and Crafts, which is now re renamed as the California College of Art. It is probably one of the most prestigious art colleges in, 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 in America. Mm -hmm. And I only did my freshman year. And I dropped out and joined the military because I come from a huge military family. So it was funny. I mean, I was in the 5th Special Forces Unit, a Green Beret. I was a paratrooper. I got hurt on a jump. And while I was rehabilitating, they changed my company commander saw me sketching and they changed my job and made me an army illustrator. Wow. So that was the first time I ever got collected by a museum. I have work that belongs to the Don F. Pratt Memorial Museum in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and at the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Museum in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. So I decided, well, since I'm doing art anyway now, again, <laughs> I might as well get out the military and go home right. and, and 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 you know pursue art as a full-time profession. So I've been a full-time artist for over 30 years. Um, wow. But being a, um, you know, a full-time artist, and I also like to always give back and, and keep my hands in arts education. So I, I teach every year, just, you know, out of the sheer love of an opportunity that was given to me because, you know, I started off on the wrong path and art helped correct that for me. So I feel a certain obligation to every year do some aspects of teaching art to young people just for that reason. But for over 30 years, I've been a, a studio artist, a professional artist. I mean, I make the bulk of my living just by painting and making art. So I have collectors that range from Michael Jordan and LeBron James to the San Francisco Giants, the um, Las Vegas Raiders, the Golden State Warriors, the Sacramento Kings, the Los Angeles Dodgers, San Francisco 49ers. Um, I have work that belongs to over a, a half a dozen uh, museums and over a dozen college collections and Fortune 500 companies. So my job is to be creative, and I like to teach young people how to monetize their creativity. Wow. Definitely. And my, I guess, kind of path was a little bit different than Milton's. Um, I always knew that I loved to paint and to draw. Um, but I never really saw anybody who looked like me doing it. And my father, who um, was also in the military, in the Air Force, um, who's actually from Moulton, um, was um, an artist as well, but he never really pursued it. And so I kind of took that as a sign to 
kind of take this path and also be that person for other students who might be creative and not really know mm. what to do with it. And so my, my focus was really more community-based, so working in the community and teaching classes and also working for nonprofits who I feel like um, really helped kind of merge the social service aspect mm -hmm. for people who, who you know, need affordable resources and, and don't know where to go to get them, and then art and providing free services for people um, in the community where they live. And so I kind of took that route. And like I said um, earlier, some of these opportunities just kind of happened because I was in that environment. And someone you know knew that I yeah. taught classes and then they would ask me to go teach or, or do theater. Um, set design or costumes or what have you. And so that I feel like was the, the turning point in my focus on really being um, a, a community organizer around the arts and providing access to it to people who might not otherwise have it. Well, how has the pandemic changed the way that y'all work? Well, um, we we moved here to Moulton just before it happened, really. <laughs> um, and when we moved, I always knew that I, I still wanted to um, work for some of the organizations that I was um, working with in California. And with Zoom and, um, you know, all this remote kind of work and education um, really made that possible. And so I continue to do... Um, fund development work. So I write grants mm -hmm. to fund art programs. And so I was still able to do that and then teach classes virtually. Um, we came and opened up our gallery space with the intent on continuing some of that community work um, and doing exhibitions and creating work for ourselves. Mm -hmm. But for me, um, that um, community aspect is really my heart in terms of where I fall mm -hmm. in the art realm. And so I knew I, I really wanted to continue that. So I didn't really start making work for myself a, until um, the pandemic. Oh. And so I've created a new body of work that I'm um, exhibiting here um, in Moulton and um, then also working virtually as a way to kind of keep those programs that I started in Sacramento going. Well, it's a lot harder to... Uh to get out there among people now because yes. you know you have to be careful but <laughs> everyone's getting comfortable with uh, doing things virtually now you yes know, you know like uh for us here in the school system we began having a lot of zoom meetings and it was awkward at first you know mm -hmm. but now oh, we can do that we do that every day <laughs> and, and it almost it almost seems like that you're sitting you know in person you know with someone when you do those uh still miss being able to be you know, out there with people though Yes. The biggest pandemic obstacle for me is the simple fact that, you know, we came with the intention of opening Gallery 157 to be a resource to the community. And as a brick and mortar gallery, you know, the goal is to mount exhibitions, invite the public into the space, create those relationships and partner with. So the one, the two things, the two biggest obstacles is not being able to have done that. Uh, we, we are just going to be having our first in-person exhibition since the pandemic started um, this Sunday, actually. And it's, it's, oh, really? da it's Daphne's <laughs> solo show. show. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but, you know, and, I, and, and it really has kind of, um, like, the, the, the biggest downer to me, because I look at everything as a possibility. I didn't look at the pandemic as, as a setback. I always looked at, at, at things as a possibility. Um, and But the one thing that I do think was... Uh, the most frustrating for me is the simple fact that I haven't been able to get to schools and visit schools and create mm -hmm. relationships with the different schools in the area because there is a need to bring art to all communities, but most importantly, into rural communities. And that was my goal for coming here. I wanted to go to places where you don't typically find art and then take an arts experience to those areas. So that's been the biggest thing that the pandemic has affected for me. And how has it... Um like you said personally, you started doing more art for yourself during the pandemic. Did it increase the amount of art that y'all did? Oh, I, I, I'm, I've been, I've actually been reviewed as one of the most prolific artists in the country. I mean, I paint all of the time. Yes. Her, different story. <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, I, 
one one of the things that I wanted to do when we moved was start working more on my own artwork. That was one of my goals. And through um, the transition and the pandemic and then also working um, um, with writing grants, I I took a focus on the grant writing because I knew there was such a need for funding for the arts. And so I work sometimes, Milton and, and I have, um, our studios are right across the hall from each other. So oftentimes I'll see him in his studio painting. I go in my studio and get on my laptop and start, <laughs> start <laughs> doing grant proposals. Um, but I really felt a calling for this particular collection that I'm exhibiting right now to really just kind of get it out. Um, it had been an idea that I had been kind of like thinking about and doing pieces here and there for many years. And so I felt like now was the time to really focus on it and complete the collection and then, um, and then share it. Um, what things did y'all have to consider before y'all decided to open a business? Location. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I mean, the only thing for, for I mean, uh, one thing, and I also like to communicate this to young people too, is like, you should never have a fear of going into business for yourself. Um, there's a great need for young people to understand the power of being an entrepreneur. Um, I like to help young people focus on their own personal creative development, but, but really how to monetize that. So we already knew, well, before we left California, we knew coming to Moulton, we were going to open a space. All we needed to find out is where was the location going to be and what was the rent going to be. <laughs> and once those two things got figured out, we, we opened up. Because um, we actually opened up before the pandemic actually kicked in. And we did, um, it was in February, what? Yeah, the end of 20? January and the yeah. shows in So we, we did, we did a, when we first got here, we did an exhibition for Black History Month to introduce ourselves to the community. Because we didn't open our gallery to the end of January. So February was our first event. Then we brought in a, a, an arts collective art song that's, uh, that's owned by a woman here, Cynthia who has a, a little art studio that a lot of people don't even know about. It's located behind the laundromat no, off of Court mm-hmm. Street. Art mm-hmm. It's art song. Cynthia, she's a wonderful person. Um, she she does a bunch of you know local art classes, and there is a, a cadre of very skilled and talented women. So it's, a, it's an all-women's art collective. And so we brought them in, and we gave them their show. But they couldn't even do their reception because we had to shut down because of the pandemic. Wow. So... Um, so that that was always the goal. So, you know, I just I am just ex- extremely excited about you know some of these restrictions coming off and giving us an opportunity to like really get into the community and 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 try to show people just you know how magical art is. But more importantly, it is really business centered. See, see, people think art is not a business, but art is a business like anything else. You know, all aspects of business, you are going to have some aspect of creativity that is included in that. And that's the one thing that I think people really should start to try to, to look more to, because I like to use this story. A lot of parents, when their kid comes home from elementary school and they bring that picture that they did in art class with their art teacher home. They'll look at it and say, oh, baby, this is so wonderful. And they'll, they'll put it on a the refrigerator. They might even frame it and take it to their office. But sometimes that communication is like, but let's focus on things that, you know, you can find a career in. Right. So I would challenge everybody to just do this little bit of research. It's very easy to do. If you went to Harvard Law or if you went to Stanford Medical, what would the cost of tuition be to go to those colleges? Now, we know that those are two prestigious institutions that are turning out lawyers every year and that are turning out doctors every year. And what does it cost to go to those schools? But what people don't pay attention to is that the same money it takes to go to Harvard Law or Stanford Medical is the same amount of money you would pay to go to RISD, which is the Rhode Island School of Design. So if RISD can charge you the same amount of money that it takes to become a doctor or an attorney, you best believe there is a career in the arts. Wow. Well, any, uh, we're just about out of time. Do y'all have any final words of advice or 
anything that you would want to say to our students? Yes, students. (laughs) (laughs) Find what you do well and learn how to monetize it. You have avenues. The one thing that the pandemic should have showed all young people is that just with your cell phone and your own personality, you could become a very lucrative business. Mm -hmm. So while we sit on our devices as young people and we are looking at someone else be extremely creative on YouTube and TikTok, they are entertaining you for money. So if you're watching them become famous and rich, why aren't you becoming famous and rich? And I would say really just experiment. You know, I think... Um, as a young person, you have opportunities to really explore, you know, not just who you are in your own development, but also the environment around you and what's available to you. So really take advantage of that. Look at every option possible. And like I said earlier, you know, it's just as um, more, uh, much work and I think um, um, a benefit to find out what you don't want to do as what you do want to do. Cool. Well, thanks for being with us, y'all. We've really learned a lot. We've enjoyed talking (laughs) to y'all today. You have been listening to Speak Out Podcast, a community outreach of the Lawrence County Career Technical Center in Moulton, Alabama. I'm your host, Larry Smith, and I'd like to thank my co-host, Ashlyn Gresham, and our guests today, Milton and Daphne Bowens. Please check out our podcast on the Lawrence County Career Technical School website, and we hope that you'll join us for future episodes.